Welcome, and thanks so much for uh, for being here for the Q&A for the Ruby on Rails, the documentary. Um, I'm your host, Elise Schaefer. Um, I'm also the host of the Ruby on Rails podcast. I'm so excited to be here. When I heard that there was going to be a Ruby on Rails documentary, um, I was filled with both excitement and joy. I think for many of us, Rails has changed our careers. Um, and as Toby said in the documentary, many people came out of the early days very changed programmers. And I think that that's true for those of us who are using Rails to build things as it is true for the people who are actually building Rails. So this is a very exciting um, opportunity. Um, and I want to thank Honeypot for, allow, uh, for asking me to host. Um, and thank you all for being here. Um, this is going to be a Q&A about Ruby on Rails and the creation of Ruby on Rails and the early days of Ruby on Rails. So um, if you have questions, you can post them in the chat. And uh, we will ask those questions um, to our cast. It's now time to invite our cast up to the stage to answer your questions. So um, if we could invite David Hanemeyer Hansen, uh, James Buck, uh, Toby Lutka, um, and uh, Jeremy Dare up to the stage, we can start answering your questions. Awesome. Welcome to the stage. Thank you for being here. Um, and thanks for being part of the documentary, I think. Um, uh, it's wonderful to have you here. Um, we do have a question that came in. Um, Becky asks, in the early days, you know, we picked Rails to start our own businesses. Now people are graduating from boot camps, looking for Rails jobs, um, and trying to find their first job. Uh, what can and should we be doing in the community uh, to help ensure we are fostering the next generation of Rails developers? Um, and I guess I can pitch that. Let's start with David. Let's start with David there. <sighs> Yeah, I think that question is, is one that was uh, really at the um, center of the new Rails Foundation that we should be doing more to get more people into the Rails ecosystem. Um, the realization that there's a bunch of companies that now depend on Ruby on Rails, everything from titans like Shopify and GitHub to medium-sized companies like those same signals and the entire span in between. If we still want to run our applications in 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, which we do, we need new blood. I mean, it's simply just the, the circle of life that goes on that you need new people coming in if you want to be able to hire them in the future. So. We really, um, we, we set up the new foundation with that for I. Um, that was the foundation that just put on the Rails World Conference that went off amazingly. And I think there's a lot of that just great energy that's coming in right now that fits with the time we're in, that people are looking to be more productive. Maybe money doesn't flow as easily as it did before. Some of the solutions that were more complicated and common, whatever, whatever. Rails is having another moment here and another opportunity to entice new people because of that enthusiasm and excitement. And I think uh, documentaries like this is exactly what feeds into that. Someone can look at this for the first time and go like, oh, I wonder, I, I want to give that a shout. I want to give that a try. And that's great. Yeah. Um, so, Toby, what's it like um, for, for you? Uh, Shopify is a pretty uh, big uh, company that's hiring Rails developers, do you have any thoughts on how we can bring more people into the community and have more Rails developers? Yeah, I, I think um, um, I think Rails is a like incredibly good technology to learn early in a career, but partly because it just um, uh, it, you know bridges the gap. Like my own kids are learning uh, to like um, to code, and like it actually has been really fun to kind of see how. Um, like absurdly abstract, uh, the, the, like the web has been made. So like, um, it, it, you know, just there was this moment where like I, I went back to, um, um, you know, Netcat <laughs> and like just sending bytes to a server just to like like demystify the entire thing. And 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 um, I think uh, if 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 that if that connects with uh, um, kids, I think actually everyone should appreciate this sort of base simplicity. And um, if you this particular appreciation. Um, leads you to like um with with rails you can be extremely productive and 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 while it still doesn't hide away those um, those components right like it's a it's a beautiful abstraction in a way that you don't trade away anything um of of of, of power but everything that isn't the core of what you're trying to accomplish is is you know at, at your fingertips so i mean we hire uh, you know a lot of uh, pe people have a lot many 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 people working on uh, rails projects in 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 Shopify, we've always found that um, we've done a mix of um, recruiting from the existing Rails community and 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 have been teaching it um, um, to people who are coming in. And um, I think 
it's 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 not that hard to learn because it just it's it's a really really good um, implementation of the of the most important and time tested um, fundamentals um, plus like opinions from people who have um, done this for a long time and you know are, are very good at making these choices about how it all just should fit, fit together and I think that's really good. Recently, I talked with Hack Club. I think David talked with uh, Hack Club too, which is this, this uh, charity non nonprofit for uh, you know where children get together and. Um, it's been amazing to hear that like Rails has been had this absolute resurgence there, partly because the rest of the web has gotten extraordinarily weirdly um, abstract in, in in places and had it's got got itself into a bit of a local maxima. And I think more and more people are uh, saying, "Hey, we would just want to build great websites qu quickly with the least amount of ceremony." And Rails is amazing for that. Yeah, it, I I think that that's a really good point. That Rails kind of fits. This is a story that I think many of us feel that Rails kind of just fits the way our brain already thinks about it, um, which is so refreshing in the early days when you're first learning it. Um, I do want to actually ask a question about like, what was it like for um, you all to be part of a documentary about something that you worked on 20 years ago as kind of like building just a, a framework? So uh, maybe let's start with Jeremy. What was it what was it like being part of a documentary that about Rails? I didn't know what to think of it at first. In fact, I was a little bit resistant to like going and diving into a bunch of nostalgia for its own sake. But it was quite, quite nice, quite fun. <laughs> Remembering old things like somebody brought up earlier with PDI. Please do investigate. Like it's fun to go back to these things that were like the currency of our life in those days, and to appreciate them, and you know, not to cling to them, but to, um, to, but to feel those things again and the parts of them that are still alive in my life now. It's great. It it gives me an appreciation and kind of respect for myself. Even of here I was at this time. Um, I'm proud of that work, and I've learned to be prouder of that work as like a young person doing those things. Like I was on I was on track. Like this is the way I want to live. This is still the way I want to live. <laughs> I, if there's any good good sense of like the direction, the directionality that you've set of like course corrections, keep bringing me back to this place. And, you know, for me, it's like, it's often like a vibes kind of thing of like the vibes are there, the vibes are there. And so it was a good self check. Yeah. All right. This is sweet. <laughs> yeah. Uh, James, how about you? How, how was it like being part of the documentary? It's kind of surreal, honestly. Um, obviously being part of Rails core back in the early days was a, a extremely transformational experience. It, it changed so much of my career trajectory and everything. It was just part of the life I was living. Like it, it, uh, it was extraordinary, but extraordinary in a personal way. And so being invited to participate in a documentary felt a little surreal in the sense of, wait, like documentaries are for these like famous people. And, you know, obviously we have luminaries here with us, but it uh, it didn't feel like the kind of thing that should be a documentary, but having participated in it, uh, it, it was wonderful. It was really, really neat. And to hear other people's memories, um, th there were stories that I hadn't, hadn't heard at all. And uh, to add those to my own timeline and see how things fit together, it was, it was really, really neat. And I'm extremely honored and uh, to be to be able to be part of this it really is uh, a neat experience. Yeah, that's awesome. Uh, David, did you when you were making Rails, did you ever think that one day you'd be in a documentary about Rails? No, I think um, it was just it's it's surreal in some sense that it's been twenty years because I also don't I don't feel like it's been twenty years. I mean, you could have told me it's been like three, four, maybe, and I would have been like, yeah, that sounds about right. Um, but there definitely was inflection points along the way. When the first extraction of Rails happened from base I was like, hey, cool, this is a nice tool. I really like using it. And I was initially just focused on, let's get this small group of Ruby developers to think it's a good idea. And so I, I focused all my attention and advocacy on the Ruby developers and then quickly realized, you know what? This is much better and probably could be much bigger than just the existing community that was there. We could actually grow the community. And I think once I started getting some of that feedback from people outside of Ruby, that Ruby was worth learning because of the things we were doing with Rails. That was the point where I thought like, okay, this could go far 
if someone is willing to learn a whole new programming language just to use a new tool or a new framework, um, there's something there, I think. Um, so there was this point from the early induction, I don't have any expectations that this is going to be anything but a toolkit for me to convincing the Ruby community that like, hey, do you want to take a look and try it out? And then the third point, getting folks outside of the Ruby community to go like, oh, I want to learn Ruby because of Rails. Those were separate stages that all set different trajectories. But I think it was that the final one of getting people outside of the community into it because of it that where I knew, or not, I didn't know, but I thought like, all right, do you know what? I think this might have legs. Yeah, that's awesome. I there was a there's another question coming in in the chat. Um, can you talk a little bit about the name Ruby on Rails? Like, how did you decide on the on Rails uh, as a name for your framework? It's really simple, actually. I couldn't get the domain name. Rails.org was not available. Rails.com was not available. Nothing I liked was available just with Rails. So that um, brought in. You know what? I need something else. Ruby on. Sounds good. So, and then it was just like, all right, now it's the domain. Let's just make it part of the the, the name. And all this post rationalization actually fits better this way. Rails is a um, sort of an honor of Ruby. This is Ruby is actually the important part here. Ma being able to use Ruby, it feels fitting that it's part of the name. But really, the banal answer is I couldn't get the domain Rails.org. Nice. Um, I think that that's uh, very relatable for those of us who uh, are always looking for good domains for our projects. Um, cool. And then this one, I, I think we can kind of uh, go around uh, a little bit and just talk about it. Um, can you talk a little bit about the origins and the history of the Rails doctrine? Um, it's one of the things I love most about Rails. Um, so can we maybe start by talking about what the Rails doctrine is and then how we arrived at that doctrine? Um, and maybe, uh, maybe we'll let's start with David again, and then we'll we'll go around the around the around the room. Yeah, so I like to think of the Rails doctrine as an extraction, in much the same way that Ruby and Rails itself is an extraction. It's not like a proclamation of things we wish to be true. I mean, it has that in it too, but it's more looking back. I think. Um, I penned this maybe actually 10 years ago, I think it was 2013. So like 10 years after, that was a good time to look at what are our actual values? Optimizing for programmer happiness, for example, that's just taken straight out of the Ruby playbook. That is what Matt says, this is why he created the language um, to be a programmer's best friend was one of the terms I've heard him say. And then convention over configuration was that key driving thing right from the start. It was the bulwark for much of the marketing that, um, do you know what, look at, all the silly things they're doing in the Java world, XML sit-ups was the thing we were talking about at the time. Um, other things like the menus on Mikasa, the people um, who are here sharing the stage with me, the early um, Rails core team set their opinions into the framework. It was not just like, oh, you could do this, or you could do that. I mean, ultimately you can, but hey, here's a core team saying, this dish is best eaten like that. Um, I think was really great. So I look at it as an extraction of the values we had fomented in those early days, the, the, the Rails core team and, uh, and Ruby itself kind of gifted to it. And then I just wrote them down about 10 years later. Nice. So um, I think if, if we can talk to Jameis and kind of ask, you know, when you're working on Ruby on Rails in the early days and, and all of these things as it's as the Rails doctrine has been extracted, like what was your experience working on that and how attractive was things like developer happiness as a goal for the framework? How important was that in the early days for you? Uh, like, like David was saying, it kind of came out afterwards, but the whole feeling of that doctrine kind of permeated the entire core team, Un unwritten, unspoken. But it was it was who we were and it was how we thought and I think it's how why we worked together so well as a team is that we all kind of had these same philosophies and same ideas. I came originally <clears throat> from a, a Java background. I was writing enterprise Java stuff um, for a university, and the the goal with a lot of Java development, in my experience, was you're trying to please everybody, and you you're trying to make it as generic and vanilla and bland as possible so that no one's going to be offended and everyone can feel mediocre about it 
And the difference with Ruby on Rails and working with this team was, it was phenomenal. It was, it was a joyous experience. It was invigorating and exciting. Um, even the, even maybe even especially the really tough problems were exciting to tackle because we were tackling them not with an eye to please everybody, but to come up with an elegant solution that expressed the problem simply and directly and gave people a quick go to, here's how you solve it, um, which isn't gonna please everyone. And it made a lot of people mad, but it made us happy. And that was kind of our goal. Nice. So uh, Jeremy, can you, uh, just piggybacking off of that, do you, um, Rails does have a lot of opinions. What was it like working on on Rails with so much, uh, so many different opinions about what, what was happening in the Rails ecosystem from other communities? Um, yeah, I don't know about opinions. It's the, the, the feeling of, uh, of who you're serving. <laughs> and uh, the idea, I, going back to the first question about how do you get hired, there's something about getting kind of beat down. You've got laid off. Like there, there's, there are up and down cycles in the economy, and you experience both of them. And some of the, look, in retrospect, some of the best times are when you have those down cycles and you're able to pick yourself up with a new opportunity for learning. You can shed tools that you adopted because it allowed you to interface with the business that you were working with. And you pick something up that works the way that you do. And you can. You have the option to do that. So uh, looking at the tooling you're using now, do you double down on it? Does it feel quite right? Um, well, you have the option to look for something else. And having this kind of option around is like you pick up a tool and oh, sweet. And then be able to work on the tool just kind of adds to that of like, I can keep making the tool that gives me this kind of feeling, like best thing ever. And it's self-serving. It's the best kind of self-serving because it's not looking at like, how am I going to get a job with this? I can do my work with it. And I, I bring that work to places um, that I can serve with it. I look for businesses that fit my tool rather than uh, looking for the best tool for the job. The kind of the, uh, the very common programmer credo of like, pick the best tool. Now I picked my tool. I love this tool. I'm going to go pick jobs that it works for. <laughs> yeah, I. Uh, that's a wonderful sentiment and I love that. So uh, Toby, when you were building Shopify in the early days, um, how much of, of this same ethos, this idea of like, we're going to pick a tool um, that we love doing. How how did that impact how you thought about building Shopify in those early days? Oh, I think Shopify is um, like even today. It's like it's um, so. So you, we we got here to through the Rails doctrine. This was um, written after uh, long after I I, I was commenting code to Rails. But like I, I read through it and was like like. Well, like basically, I, I thought, well, I learned nothing here because that was all completely obvious. That is not going to be true for for anyone who wasn't on that core team, right? Like it just like was so obviously like here's a beautiful um, rendering of um, uh, a set of opinions that I have been guiding the, 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 this this framework, which I think everyone could have named, but maybe no one could have quite as prettily assembled as David himself. Um, but like I, I think what uh, um, uh, you know both. Uh, James and Jeremy say is is really key here because like I think the, the importance like we're talking about it 20 years ago right like the world was very 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 different um, back then like I, I um, and uh, without going too philosophical about this like uh, most of us are, um, have sort of done our first um, explorations of the internet in in in, in the 90s and um, there was a uh, um, belief that. Uh, what the internet would bring would be extreme like um sort of agency and power to the individual like this sort of distribution of capabilities to 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 everyone everyone can have a web like and i was growing up as a, as a young kid but all, I, I was thinking about this the only way i figured out i could have actually done something from my living room that someone I've never met would have uh, um, heard about would be maybe calling into some kind of radio show or game show or something like that. it's like there's nothing Right, and then the internet came around, and suddenly you could do all these things and talk to you know people in Silicon Valley. We didn't even know where it was for for the next uh, for a long time. So, um, and and so um, you know when Java and like Java back then is a different thing from Java now, really. Uh, but like Java back then was like the sort of ultimate of like actually let's constrain what you can do just so because so that you can't hurt yourself basically. We really, we like the, the, the Mount Olympus doesn't believe you to actually be able to uh, write code that uh, doesn't um, uh, crash your computer. Therefore, we, we restrict your surface uh, potential here um, and then put you in some kind of uh, like 
um, construct of uh, like a harness. And um, that was like exactly the wrong way to a lot of us, but yet we were supposed to use it in the jobs we probably rather got fired from um, because I don't think any of us would have been very good in this kind of environment. And then the, um, uh, you know, what's so wonderful at some point you're, you're back to the web and here you like um, start a web server and, 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 and again, one of those requests comes to you and like, from that point on, it's up to you, right? Like it's it's like this is my world. Like I I own the response here. I I, I you know if it's someone looking for a product to sell, if if I, if I construct the correct HTML that's perfectly like um, uh, causes the, the web browser to 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 show something that's inspiring or per, like perfect for use case, uh, a sale is made in business and agency, and you we can reach for independence and 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 be, have a sovereign power of our own destiny. That is a completely uh, co contradictory uh, view to the sort of centralization, decentralization of agency and power um, perspective. And what's so crazy about like, Rails is like it just like it, it, it tapped into this moment that we recognized from a couple of years uh, ago, but was a uh, uh, countercultural to that. Like it, it actually gave all the power and agency and leverage back to the engineers and said, here's a set of tools by which you can move way faster than otherwise um, things you need an entire team for. And so Shopify in itself is kind of like that same spirit to uh, brought further to like uh, uh, productized, right? Like it's 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 still a tool. It's it doesn't reduce what you can do. It actually uh, like allows you to do whatever you want to do, but makes the things that we think is super important to starting e-commerce businesses extraordinarily simple and and get see you hit the ground running through opinions and uh, through um, uh, you know all, like all the things that are in a in a red stock chain. You could probably um, make a very good I mean, I would like to think Shopify could have a very, very similar document and probably ought to have one um, that, that doesn't require a lot of changes. Nice. That's awesome and inspiring. So we have a question here. How important for the web is it to innovate from inside open source communities? And what are the areas of the next web should humans think about and focus on? Um, and maybe let's start with Jeremy. Uh, you're muted. <laughs> yes, I want to put a question. How important for the web is to innovate from inside open source communities? What do you think? I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> it's a broad, open-ended kind of sense of what should we do next? I'm going to, I'm doing what's right in front of me, and that's what the open source community is doing right now. I think the trend we're seeing now with with Rails and Kamal and uh, David just did Skiff. It's uh, it's printing things back, making things smaller, reclaiming ownership of the things that uh, that we'd like to be able to do. So do the things we want to do. Uh, offload the stop offloading the stuff that uh, it turns out that we were incurring a greater liability by allowing other things to kind of eat into our own mind share, our own capability. Of I need to go learn all this stuff and really do this basic thing. Well, maybe it's still maybe it's still basic. It's like going back to Netcat to interact with HTTP a good reminder that this is just letters going over a pipe. Like you're saying HTTP something, something, you're having a little conversation. Like we can go back to things being simple and kind of tear down the complexity. Maybe, in, you know, there's some, probably some human cycle here of like Jubilee of like forgive debts or, you know, a creative destruction of like, let's just let things just break apart in a positive way so we can rebuild them. Like that's what ecosystems need. Like they need to burn down a little bit so they can grow back. Uh, okay, James, do you have any other thoughts on how how important is open source to innovation on the web? Specifically, open source, I think, is is hugely innovative because I think open source developers are working under very niche constraints. Usually, you you start an open source project because you have an itch and you you want to scratch that. Whereas like a larger company is operating under a larger set of, they have more resources for one thing, they have specific business constraints that they're looking to solve. And um, this seems like the really interesting problems happen at the smaller scale where um, someone just has a wild hair and wants to see what happens. So I feel like open source is hugely important to, to innovating. Um, but it's probably not the last the last word either. Like you get larger company, like Shopify, for instance, has the resources to take these wild hairs and and build them up and polish them and make make them something big. Uh, Thirty Seven Signals has more resources than than you know uh, a twenty something working 
in the evenings on the weekend could could possibly do. So anyway, I think it, I think it's hugely important. Sort of tangentially, David, um, there's a, a sort of tangential question to this about like what it was like to like how Basecamp influenced the evolution of Ruby on Rails, and I think that's kind of related because it sort of speaks to the open source slash um, proprietary code base kind of divide. Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. So I think uh, connected to uh, Topi's point about decentralization, that this is really the power of open source that allows individuals like myself uh, very early on in my career working for a company that didn't have funding, it didn't have unlimited resources to build something like this. Basecamp was um, built by me on the programming side and a couple of designers working on it. And that was enough to form the foundations of a great business that's been going for over 20 years and this framework that we're talking about here now. And I think to me, I feel an obligation that that window has to remain open. We cannot close the window of what single individuals are able to do because we let the complexity run away from us. So this has been the driving force between or behind so much of my involvement with Rails is constantly saying, do you know what? Yeah, I'm not a single developer anymore. Uh, Ruby and Rails, or 37 Singles has a lot of developers. Shopify has many times more than that. GitHub has so and so many. There's Lots of great big companies of various sizes have been built on top of Ruby and Rails, but my true allegiance is to the single individual who starts tomorrow, is to sort of, when it's all burned down, what can one person do if the only investment that they have to put into something is time? They can't tap other people. They can't tap commercial resources. They can't just buy a bunch of stuff. They need open source. If open source is not there, none of this is going to happen. I would never have created Ruby on Rails if I had had to buy a license to every piece of technology we needed in our staff. If I'd had to buy an Oracle database and a, a Windows license and a this license and a that license, the barrier to entry would just have been too high. So I think there's an obligation for all of us in the open source community to really combat complexity. And it's odd because it's sneak in so easily because open source is so powerful that it not only helps the single developer, it also helps the huge conglomerates, right? So that's good. A lot of the time we can come together, share comments, contribute things, but we always have to have that one eye on complexity running away from us because that is the natural thing that happen in large companies. Complexity will run away from them unless it's kind of forcefully drag back. And that's where, where my interest is, is to, to drag it back, um, to recreate or preserve is a better word, preserve the conditions that allowed me as a single developer to create Basecamp. That is my gold star, North Star, when it comes to Ruby on Rails development. Yeah, and it sounds like there, there's a little bit of a, like rising tide lifts all, all boats, right? Like it's good for individual developers, but it's also good for, Shopify, Huge. This, this is why I, I don't see this. Um, some of the open source community see a conflict between large companies and open source. I don't. I see a, if you have the right mindset to this, this is absolutely uh, the most beautiful ex expression of the shared commons, the most beautiful ex expression of like human collaboration and commerce is what enables that. We would not have a 25% faster Ruby, unless Topi had sponsors the white jet development at Shopify, right? So looking at some of these things and going, do you know what? We can have a lot of really nice things because commerce is not bad. It's actually good. Capitalism is actually good when it comes to these things. They're not in opposition. We can have the best of both worlds. It requires weighing things. But we're perfectly capable of doing that. And I think Ruby on Rails is a wonderful illustration of an open source community that's open source through and through when it comes to what we allow into the framework, but at the same time embraces capitalism, embraces companies, embraces the commons and commerce at large. And I think um, that just warms my heart because I am an open source developer. I'm also a business owner and an entrepreneur, and I want to see these things coexist in a happy um, blend. Nice. So uh, our next question, maybe we can start with, with Toby. What emerging technologies do you find most interesting or promising for the future of 
web development and maybe for Rails too, more specifically. Well, I, I, I think so. So, like, I want to absolutely echo what, what, what David said. And I think actually David has answered that question. You know, like the emergent technology that, that we need that's going to be really meaningful for web development is um, the realization that uh, simplicity is a feature itself. Like, it's we got to get back there. It is crazy what we've built in terms of abstraction stacks to solve. Um, fairly undifferentiated problems in in, in, in a multitude of ways. Uh, like it, it's it's an important brainstorm, but like the the the, the world of technology um, has to move forward in um, uh, zigs and zags where every direction change um, uh, means we are throwing away a couple of uh, successful discoveries of things that did not work. And we, we go the other way with the things that have proven uh, time. And we kind of like, I don't know how many times you need to go to six and six and somehow somehow hold on to this over complexification thing. Uh, we just simply do not need it. We, we need to. We only need it for the exploration of what's possible. Um, I, I find I find the sentiment that complexity is a bridge to simplicity to be up totally beautiful um, and, and real. Um, now, of course, uh, it's very hard to make simple things, right? Like it it, it is significantly hard to make something uh, simple than something complex. I, I think the um, the web browsers have not moved with uh, with us. Uh, and so we, we had to kind of move into user space, so to speak, a lot of things that uh, um, the web, so web browser could have done in the past for all these compatibility reasons. We are very lucky to live now in a world of evergreen browsers, which are actually um, just becoming better and better and better at like um, uh, providing just the, everything that you need to 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 get going. We have like just things like pass keys or so. It's just such an obvious idea. Why like the word password create craziness? Um, just to name one thing. Um, but like um, so 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 the web browsers are getting more capable. The 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 um, um, the the frameworks are becoming um, finally getting over the client side application versus server side thing. And it's just like an end. It's like use the platform. Is the right uh, way of thinking about it, and um, um, the systems that we use are going to yeah. allow us to do this in a non-ceremonious way without like massive separations of these kind of uh, things. And that is a technology all by itself, and will lead to massive, massive uh, productivity wins, which will lead to better software for all of us. And this is exactly what we want. Which is cycle is kind of obvious here. Yeah. Um, I agree with that. So, uh, Jeremy, do you have any thoughts on this about technologies that are maybe important to the future of the web and to Rails? Yeah, I, I'd echo the, the sentiment about web browsers being in the world of evergreen web browsers. I, part of looking back at the early days of Rails was how do we cope with these disjoint, weird implementations of different browsers doing different things. And everybody needs this arcane, esoteric knowledge about what's possible here, what's possible there. And you just have to build it up by stubbing your toes a million different times. And that's just not quite necessary anymore. If you can count, I mean, browsers still have their consistencies, but you can count on them as a platform. Um, as far as emerging technologies, I go back to the feeling of like what happens when there's a burn in the forest of the willingness and ability to devolve a little bit rather than focusing on constantly evolving <laughs> of what happens when we have fewer tools. Um, of all things, I've been watching this show alone about people trying to survive. And it's just an interesting thing seeing uh, humans trying to cope with fewer tools, simpler tools. And you could do you could do a lot of living with just those things. And what does that look like in the tech world? We're not on the browser. Be happy that the browser is evergreen now. And if anything, um, try to support other browser implementations. Like seeing um, fewer browser implementations is like an existential threat. And uh, captured by mobile devices and operating systems, another kind of existential threat. Uh, these are things that open source needs to I mean, kind of do battle with in a way. Like there needs to be another option that is fully open and everybody has access to. Yeah, I think that there's uh, there's something there about like how browsers being evergreen, like living in a world where we don't have to remember every browser prefixed version of a CSS rule is like so much better now. Um, awesome. So uh, this one, we can kind of go around. What is your favorite feature that is not widely used in Rails? Uh, and let's start with uh, Jameis. <clears throat> I was hoping I had a little more to think about it. Oh. Uh <laughs> <laughs> uh, honestly, some of my favorite features of Rails are the 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 little gems hidden away in active support. 
a lot of the core extensions, for instance, are some of my my favorite quality of life features in Rails, because um, once you learn about them, it, it's obvious that well, yeah, of course this should exist. Um, and some of them I use so often that when I finally find myself working on something that doesn't include active support, I'm surprised that it's not part of Ruby. Um, like blank, for instance, is such a fundamental uh, little predicate. And yet, <clears throat> what do you do when it doesn't exist? You kind of have to reinvent it. Um, so anyway, I, I think that's where I'd go. My, my favorite little features of Rails are the, the little gems hidden away in active support. They, uh, they make me smile. Nice, me too. Uh, David, why don't we go to you next? I would probably say uh, delegated types. It's a pattern that has been incredibly consequential for our work at 37 Signals. It is probably the number one architectural pattern that we use in both Basecamp and Hay these days. And it's in Rails, and I made somewhat of an effort to, to promote it. And it's not actually a large feature. It's more of an encapsulation of a pattern, if you will. But I, I, I haven't seen enough usage of it, considering the fact that if I was to build any substantial application today, I can't imagine building without delegated types. So part of this is, of course, my own fault. We extracted it from... Um, base camp and then didn't do a good enough job of explaining why it was necessary. I've promised a video on this for my tour of um, building software for I think about five years. But uh, yeah, a vote for delegated types, look into that, a way of uh, constructing your domain model um, just that it remains just so flexible and easy to foster reuse. Really the best of what object-oriented programming was supposed to do when you have to deal with databases. Yeah, that sounds great. I look forward to seeing the video about delegated types when, if you ever get, get around to it. <laughs> uh, let's go to Toby next. Um, what are some things in Rails that you think are not widely used but should be more widely used? Um, I think it's, um, I'd point at active relation as like an underappreciated component of Rails. Like it, it's, it's sort of a weird one to pick because it's like obviously there's like all these high level components which just use it underneath, but like um, the direct use, usage of it is like, there's a whole lot of, um, I, I, this is something I see in Shopify all the time where people are like, I was sort of use, like doing the brutalist version of like active record usage. Um, uh, and um, uh, at some point that become like, maybe this is an area of a hot path that, that, that should be treated differently. And then we go directly to like reach for strings um, and uh, SQL and so on. And that feels like maybe out with a bath water. It's like, it's, it's amazing to have such a good abstraction sitting between those things. And it's, it often is um, very surprising. So I, I, I like this one. I think like an underappreciated detail actually by which, which I think was super novel was, um, 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 and certainly one which everyone's using though is um uh the like a folder structure <laughs> like like as a uh, as, as an opinion from 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 early it's like again it's 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 very used but just like what that did alone for like actually allowing people to move from diff from project to project uh it, like um back in, back in boasted not having to relearn everything was absolutely massive yeah the folder structure is kind of underappreciated it's one of those things where it's like it takes this sort of cognitive load out of your brain when you're working on a project or you're just getting started. Uh, Jeremy, do you have a, a feature of Rails that you think is under underused? Uh, yeah, I'd say concerns. Concerns have gotten a lot of flack over the years, but uh, they're uh, an antidote to the feeling of, of, I need a different container for all this stuff. I'm going to put this stuff into some other object that's going to take responsibility for things and letting that responsibility kind of sit a little bit more lightly in the smaller set of uh, seats of responsibility that are out there, controllers and models. And you don't need to create a whole constellation of other things to put your mark on, this is my code. I set out the containers for these things. Uh, it takes some uh, humility and discipline to keep things in their simple places and treat them as traits of that simple thing. And concerns uh, wrap that up and be willing to embrace them <laughs> is a big step.
yeah, I think it's it's kind of concerning how much uh, concern there is about concerns. I'm sorry, that was a bad joke. <laughs> um, okay, so we are we are kind of getting pretty close, but uh, one question that I think people have in the in the chat is, you know, it's been 20 years of Rails that's brought us to where we are now. Uh, what do we think we'll see in the next 20 years? Um, and maybe we can start with David for this one. I would very much like to push forward of this simplification drive. I think we've had an enormous expansion of what's possible with the web. And I think um, really opened up a bunch of things to make wonderful applications that people love to use. But now we need a contraction. We need, as uh, Jeremy said, like we need a productive burn. We need a burn to clear away some of the ways how we got there, some of that complexity bridge. We actually need to burn the bridge. We need to burn that bridge of complexity and we need to arrive at a place of simplicity where, again, we're looking at what can a single developer do and not just do, but understand. I, as probably anyone else, is super excited about what's going on with AI. I think it is probably the most exciting major technology movement that I've seen since the internet. Um, and I also think like we got to be ready to, to be on par with that. If we keep making our understanding of everything so complicated that humans can't fit it all in their brain, like, yeah, do you know what? It's going to be hard for humans to keep up. Uh, I think we have to make it easy for ourselves. We have to deal with the fact that we have such limited capacity compared to these supercomputers. And that comes with being able to understand whole systems, understand whole um, sort of tool change without subdividing it into a thousand different specialties. Because I think once you do that, uh, all the, the fear mongering that there is about AI and existential risk and so on, a lot of that comes in that space where we don't understand the whole thing. And then our brain just steps in and starts filling the gap with boogie monsters. Um, let's get the boogie monsters out of here. Let's work with tools that are simple enough where we can understand the whole thing, yet still lean on AI to make our work easier, to make it a wonderful tutor for us. Um, I see a future where, where AI is, is something that we welcome, that we embrace without delegating our understanding of the world to. Nice. So Toby, can you maybe uh, touch on that too about uh, AI and the future in the next 20 years and how that might impact how we build uh, Rails apps? I think it's 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 huge. And like I, I think what draws us all to Ruby is that um, um, that it allows us to express ourselves in a in a in a way um, like the best way to think about code has always been that uh, you you write code for um, your future self for for your coworkers and it just happens to be executable by computers. Like Ruby already is uh, has been incredible at making you not have to compromise the way you would like to communicate about the system um, uh, while still allowing it to be uh, um, executable. I think this is. Um, one of those places where like AI is just going to uh, like be able to step this into a completely next gear. Like we, we I mean, like like I, I'm I'm dealing with a lot of very high traffic environments with uh, with, with Ruby, where Ruby does like again now well documented very well. Um, but uh, there is manual steps, uh, of course. Like you 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 will have to potentially get in a place where, where you have to deal with trade-offs where um, you have to make things a little bit less clear so that they happen to be uh, uh, faster executable because you're dealing with a, like, a, like a real system, real VM, like, and, and, and so on, and not everything is fully um, optimized by Whited yet. And um, um, I, I feel like that kind of work of like this sort of specialization of, uh, you know, dialing it in for the CPU architecture that you have or for the entire, like, I, I think this is going to be increasingly moving to the background to automated processes that are fairly organic and dynamic um, and, and could be driven very well by like AI, AI systems. So I think we're actually going to get a more pure version of uh, what we appreciate so much about the Ruben Rails ecosystem in, in the future because um, like totally apart from the conversations that people like to have over beers and increasingly in uh, uh, capitals of the world, I guess, uh, uh, about uh, where AI is leading, um, uh, the utilitarian 
benefit here is just enormous. Like like we 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 love Rails, we love Ruby for its productivity uh, gain. We love Rails for its productivity gain. We should like love uh, what AI can do for its productivity gain. And both things combined like are just even better together. So that's awesome. I, I'm super super excited um, for 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 where this is going to lead. I think um, 20 years from now we're going to look back and saying, hey, we. we we had like like all the right ideas. We, we we foreshadowed a lot of kind of things that end up um, being uh, optimal in like maybe with some tweaks that, that we've discovered later. Um, it's going to be recognizable, but we cannot believe the amount of leverage that we are sitting on top of because of all the sort of systems that are uh, helping us make the vision come true. Awesome, Jameis. Uh, what are you excited about for the next twenty years of Rails? Uh, I mean, I hate to sound like a broken record, but I, I, I totally agree about the AI point. Um, just that it's a, a fundamental shift in, in in how we think about problem solving now. Um, it, a lot of people are looking to AI as as a, some kind of savior, like we're just going to be able to explain what we want, and it's going to pump out a, a full like. Rails application for us with the design all all pretty and done, and I don't see that happening honestly. But I do see AI becoming a a kind of partner, like a, another tool that we use that we can lean on, and and you know maybe Rails development in twenty years will will look um, less like one guy hunched over a keyboard and and more like you know one guy hunched over a keyboard with a, a ghost over his shoulder. It's uh, kind of whispering in his ear and helping him to to pick the right abstractions and so forth but um it's it's really exciting and and i think the entire industry is is already kind of shaking and 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 starting to to metamorph into into something something new and something something different and i i fully expect rails to to ride that wave and in whatever shape that takes for rails and i look forward to seeing where it goes yeah, it's certainly an exciting time uh, to be in this industry, I think. Uh, Jeremy, do you have any thoughts about uh, the next 20 years of Rails? Yeah, I echo the, the riding the wave. There's the whole apocryphal saying about uh, that you live in interesting times. <laughs> if, you're, if you're facing the future and feeling insecurity, of like, pay attention. <laughs> and it's time to ride the wave, not fight it. And how can we ride it? If anything, like, check your posture, check your stance, check your readiness to adapt and move. And you don't need to predict the future. You just need to be in step with the current moment as it arrives and try to have a play a part in it. And uh, Rails has demonstrated, and the community too, they're demonstrated our capability to, to ride with the present and to seek out a future that looks like we want it to be. So how do we actualize the future that we'd like to see? Well, we keep riding it and keep making moves that we'd like to make. Awesome. Thank you so much. I think that's a wonderful uh, sentiment to end this on. Thank you all so much for being in the documentary and for joining this Q&A and giving our audience uh, the opportunity to ask you questions about Rails. Uh, I really appreciate the conversation and I'm sure our audience does as well. Um, for the audience, this Q&A will also be published on the Honeypot YouTube channel so you can catch it afterwards there. Um, thank you so much. Uh, there. I think uh, there's a, uh, oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry, something popped up. Uh, there's, um, you'll be able to catch it there. Uh, thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, I appreciate you all. And thanks again to Honeypot for making the documentary and for uh, having us all here for this q and It's been a wonderful time. I had a lot of fun and I hope that you had a lot of fun too. It's super fun. Thank you so much for, for, for including me in working on this and like doing this super, really, really great. Thank you all. Ditto.